welcome again, scholars, to our uh, continued lectures on um, our platform. I hope and trust you are doing well. I've been praying for you. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Glorious one of Israel, mighty God, we ask that you be with us even as we continue learning. We seek your spirit who is able to speak to us even now. I remember these, our scholars, wherever they are. Please, Lord, bring to their attention these things so that they might make sense and that we might see how your kingdom has grown in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in, the, in our history, of the Christian church, we are learning in segments. Uh, for example, you notice that uh, today we are covering um, still the period BC 5 to 100 AD, continuing, which is essentially the period of time that deals with the spread of Christianity. As we have covered, Christ Jesus is born, we learned about who he was. We learned about what he began to do. We learned about his death. And now his movement has begun. We close by learning about the nature of his kingdom, how it is global, how it has to be taken to the world. Now, I want us to pick up from there and first of all, understand the geography of what we are dealing with. Uh, when you understand what we are dealing with in our history of the Christian church, then you will be helped a lot. If you look carefully at this map, you will see, uh, for example, you will see this is what is called the Mediterranean Basin. The Mediterranean Basin is basically the surrounding area that surrounds the Mediterranean Sea. You will notice if you get to this point here, this is where Jerusalem is. This is where it all began. Now, obviously, scholars, I told you one thing, even from the beginning. I said, if you want to understand Christian history, you've got to have a knowledge of the geography of the world. This is a global mandate which covered and covers the globe as a whole, the whole earth. So this is where it began. I would actually challenge you, please, please, memorize, short of a better word, I will use, just use the word memorize, memorize or rather conceptualize this entire map that you see here. At the bottom here, you see Africa. You see Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco. Now, this is the modern, modern names, uh, which were not the names in those days. But the, the critical cities still remain the same. You will notice this is still Jerusalem here, where we have Israel, Israel the nation. Jerusalem is here. You will notice Alexandria here, which was one of the greatest, uh, very reputable city under the Roman Empire. You will notice here, when you go here, you come to Corinth, to Antioch, to Antioch here. And again, you need to know this because as we learn the Christian history, it is virtually not possible for you to conceptualize things properly if you don't understand this map. Now, let me make some huge important things about this map. You will notice that here is Jerusalem, right here, Israel. This is where it all began. You will notice when we look at other maps, it began spreading, going up, crossing into Cyprus, going here, going here into Greece, into Athens, Thessalonica, into finally into Rome. Now, what I want you to remember, and I want you to really get this stuck in your brain. I mean, stuck. When I say stuck is, think of it because you will need to remember this. 
ultimately, when we spoke of Jesus Christ's ministry being in the context of the Roman Empire, I want you to keep in mind, Rome is here. This is where Italy is. This is where Rome was even that time, the city of Rome. Now, you will remember the Romans were the rulers. They were ruling the Roman Empire. The Romans had this whole territory as their territory, which included this place here called Greece. Now, I want you to remember what I shared already. There were two major influences to anybody who lived in this area. First of all, the Roman Empire themselves, the Roman Empire and its Roman uh, culture, its Roman citizenship, its Roman uh, military. Everything was Roman. I mean, it was. Rome is Rome. But remember what I said? I said, this here, Greece, which was the kingdom over which the Roman Empire came before the Roman Empire were the Greeks, the Greeks. Now, the Greeks are from here. This is Athens, Athena. This is where you find the capital city of thinkers. Don't take that as a joke. I really mean it. There are, I mean, Western thinking, even, um, even Islamic thinking, all borrowed their thoughts from the Greeks. So when you look at Greece here, which is the eastern, which, which, is in, which is Greece where Athens is, where we have the philosophers, where we have the, the Socrates, the Plato, the Aristotle, the, it, it is all here. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I want you to remember, as we start learning, you will see two groups of people, and we will always start classifying them as being west or being east. This is the line that will draw the west from the east. The west will always be Italy and going this side. Please remember that. Because you, when we will start learning in future about the Pope being in Rome, in the Western Christianity, we are referring to Western Christianity demarcated along this line here, this going this side. We will talk of the, Greek, the, the Eastern side, and ultimately it will make a lot of sense because we'll come and talk of the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, the Eastern Church, they were Christians, but at some point we, you will learn how they split into two major groups. Uh, something we'll cover up when we come to the Great Schism of 1054. But you need to keep in mind, as a matter of fact, this will be coming important, and you will hear me refer to it because there will be a time, it's important that you capture this, there will be a time when the capital city of Rome as an empire will be moved from here to here, to Istanbul, to Constantinople. Constantinople is here. You, you, we will come and learn when, when, the, when the, uh, the, the Roman Empire, capital city, will be removed from Rome by Constantine to Constantinople, we will start referring to Constantinople as the East we will refer to Rome as the West. When the Pope will move to, 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 to move from here and to have a Pope here, we'll be referring to about the Pope in the East and the Pope in the West. So keep this in mind because it will be very critical for you to understand it. Now, obviously, the, the Western world, in this case, when we will start now talking about when we get into the thick, the thick of the, the, the issues. You will learn that the Western side will be composed of Italy, of, uh, of Germany, of, uh, of France, of Spain. These will be the key players, and obviously England up there. And then when we we'll talk of the East, Greece, 
or rather uh, Greece and the countries this side will be in the picture. I wanted to make sure you understand this. It's important. You could almost uh, get a question on this for your exams, but I, I don't want you to focus on your exams. I want you to, I want you to master this, to understand this. Now that you've understood this, uh, let's see if we can go to, if we can now move to the next slide. In our next slide, you will notice that Paul is the champion, regarded as the champion of the gospel. Paul, as the champion of the gospel, you will notice that, uh, if you remember what we covered already, basically, Paul, who joins the apostles in Acts chapter 9, as an apostle called by God, Immediately, Paul comes on the scene in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. You actually see a shift, a shift even in who is being talked about by the author, Luke. It's important for us, very important for us to remember that as we learned, Christianity and its spread began in Jerusalem. But when the Christians were persecuted in Jerusalem, and I think you remember the persecution in Acts chapter 7, uh, where Stephen was even stoned in AD 34 or 35. And when Stephen was stoned, the persecution began headed by this man, the Apostle Paul. When Paul began persecuting the church in Acts chapter 9, the Bible says they scattered. Actually, in chapter 7 itself, as soon as Stephen is stoned, chapter 8 comes up and says, because of the persecution that arose in Jerusalem, the believers scattered. When the believers scattered, and in Acts chapter 9, Paul is converted. Now, keep in mind, chapter 1 to chapter 7, the gospel, Christianity, is almost localized to Jerusalem. People have believed in thousands, they are Jews, in uh, the pre-high priests or priests have believed they are Jewish nature. Now the gospel, according to Christ Jesus, as he mandated the Holy Spirit, when he said, and ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my disciples in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. So now, the, the gospel in Jerusalem had been preached. They would continue preaching. But now, during the persecution, they now began going to Samaria, to Judea, the rest of Judea, and to the rest of the world. That's how come you now see in Acts chapter 8, Philip leaves and goes to Samaria for the gospel. But now, the one man, who picks up and champions the propagating of the good news about Christ Jesus is no other than the man Paul, the Apostle Paul. Who was Paul? You will learn that Paul was born in Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen. He did not buy his, his citizenship. He was born one in Tarsus educated under Professor Gamaliel. Now, you will see all this in the text that I have cited. It is important that you keep in mind that Paul was a, an educated person under the feet of one of the ablest teachers of the time. You will see me as I teach this course. Once in a while, I will pause and do some commercials. This is why it's very important, very important for you to sit under the feet of able, capable teachers or lecturers who have immersed themselves in that which they teach. Paul comes out as an educated, learned person. But you will notice again, in the humble Paul that he became, he says, I count all this as useless, rubbish, when I look at the task and what Christ Jesus, my Lord, did. But Paul is prepared 
for the gospel. He becomes the propagator of the gospel to the world. From Acts chapter 9 to the, to the last chapter of the book of Acts, the dominant character is Paul. 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 Now you find Peter in chapter 10, you find Peter in chapter 12, but I mean, the time has now, the, the movement has shifted from Jews only into the Gentile world. And at this time, Paul is the champion to the Gentile world. Paul is a writer. Now it's important for us to keep this in mind because you will notice that throughout Christian history of the Christian church, the people who have influenced the Christian movement are not just people who were able orators or able speakers. They were, and it's not just able administrators. The people who have influenced the church are writers, spiritual writers, people who have written statements to defend the faith. And Paul was such. No wonder Paul stands as a giant. By the way, in my uh, once in a while, you will hear me flash out these commercials. When I was in school, I was so much carried by the Apostle Paul, so carried that he became my mentor, that when I had my firstborn son, I named him Paul. I even prayed that the Lord will help him to become a, a minister. And he trained as a minister. Even though he doesn't work as a minister, he works as a church elder. <laughs> um, but the point I am making is, Paul as a writer, you will notice that he is credited with 13, if not 14, if you had the book of Hebrews, out of the 27 New Testament books. What does that tell you about this man? He, he is... I mean, he is, first of all, an educated man, but a very humble man who counted his education nothing when it came to the gospel. He is the champion to the Gentiles. He actually calls himself a, 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 a minister called to preach to the Gentiles. He is a writer. I mean, he comes from, he writes a book to the Romans, and by the way, the book of Romans is the most exhaustive, systematic outline of the concept of salvation. It's excellent. He writes, he, he writes reactionary books like the book of Galatians. He writes pastoral books like the book of Timothy and Titus. He writes, I mean, he just writes. But this man is also a pastor. You will notice... When Paul will preach to this group and he has finished the circle, he was an itinerant preacher, he would say, let's go back and see how they are doing. He was a pastor at heart. And that's just what it, what it took to grow the church. Paul was a polemicist, a defender, a doctrinal defender. And this is evidenced in Acts chapter 15 in the Council of Jerusalem. And the Council of Jerusalem <clears throat> stands out as one of the most, uh, most vivid, uh, maybe most starting point of an ecumenical council. And how does it begin? It began by people who came to Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas were uh, pastors or teachers or evangelists or uh, apostles, and they introduced a, an additional requirement to the gospel. They say unless people are circumcised and unless they obey the law of Moses, they cannot be saved. The apostle Paul, a polemicist, is one who defends the doctrines from the biblical point of view, these are defenders of the faith using the Bible, unlike uh, others who might use others, but these are defenders using the, the texts. Paul stood up and said, the gospel you have brought is not a gospel. A man is not saved because they obey the law of Moses or because they are circumcised. 
This led them to descend to Jerusalem where they went, and there was a council there. You will notice, even though this is not a, a class in theology, so I won't go into the theology, but I'll comment on the theology. It was important that in that council, they protect the Orthodox faith. They protect, and I'm using the word protect because people, the believers, the apostles knew what the gospel was, but these new people or strangers come and introduce a gospel that is not a gospel. The church had to protect the gospel understanding. The Bible says they had much debate. And after much debate, James, who seemed to have been the chair, uh, stood up and summed the comments of Peter, the comments of Paul, and said that uh, it looks, it is, it's, it is good for the, to the elders and to the Holy Spirit that we do not burden the Gentiles with all these mosaic laws or the, Mo, the laws of Moses and the circumcision. Because as Peter articulated in this chapter, that salvation is by grace. You know, it's just important that I read that statement because this will become a contentious point throughout history. The Bible says in Acts chapter 15, and uh, Peter stood up, and this is what he said. Verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. And he's referring to Acts chapter 10 when he went to preach to Cornelius. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No! We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. So in the Jerusalem council, the apostles protected the gospel truth so that it is not invaded or corrupted by other teachings. And Paul was a champion as a polemicist. He was a champion of defenders of the truth. Now, you can learn a lot about Paul, but this sums up the man Paul as a person. Now, you know, if I had to take a little commercial here, I guess I would say, uh, as a minister, and many of you taking this class are training to be gospel ministers, mirror yourself against Paul and see where you are. Now, look at the next thing that we see here, which is um, the acts of the Holy Spirit now in movements. How the Holy Spirit now moved and went from one place to the other taking the good news. And I like it because really the spreading of the gospel is uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. I want to keep that. We've already covered it. And the more we remember that, the more we will see how and why the church in the future lessons will fall because of moving away from that. Now, coming here again, you will see here is Jerusalem. Here is Jerusalem, and you will notice that uh, from here, the gospel grows. The apostles are moving from here, Jerusalem. They go to Antioch. They go across here. They go across as far as here, Italy. You notice here, which is Rome. Now, only the apostle Paul and uh, Peter later on reached Rome. Remember, when you reach Italy, you've reached Rome, and Rome, when you get there, you get to the territory or the capital city where Augustus, where the, the emperors lived 
and this is, I mean, this is like now getting to the capital city. And Paul went and went. As far as Paul is concerned, he covered the gospel to the known world. The world at that time was what we are seeing here on the screen. And Paul went everywhere and he covered every space. That is the gospel and how it spread in the New Testament times. Now, hold on, hold on, time out. What are we doing? This is not a theology class. This is a class in history. So we've so far learned they have moved from Jerusalem and they've gone as preachers in the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, as they move, what else do we see here? Let me make this statement, and this is profound. We need to keep this, and we need to make sure that this is heard. If you want to change the world throughout its history, present and future generations, do what? Right. Fellow scholars, I don't know how I can emphasize and underline this. And, and just, I don't even know. But I want to appeal to you. If you want to influence the world, if you want to be an effective, ever-influencing people, person, please write. Write. Throughout history where we are going, I don't have to repeat this. The influencers are people who have written. Now let's, let's be a little bit uh, at the application level now. Paul and his colleague. The man did not marry for the sake of preaching the gospel. He did not draw a salary so that no one could accuse him of doing ministry for profit or gain. He was willing to die for the Lord. He risked his life. He was persecuted for Christ more than any other apostle. He preached to more audiences in different cities than any other recorded New Testament time preacher. Modern preachers would do well to emulate such an example. Let me now stop here for a moment because, you know, yes, this is a history class, but I did warn you that history one of the purposes of history is to motivate you, it's to challenge you, it's to direct you, it's to help you see how others have done things. Now, uh, this is a higher level. <laughs> this is just a higher level. I want to go it, uh, this is level per level now. This is, this is not a lower level. There are some of us, there are some of you ministers who are in this class training as gospel workers who may have to be and respond to God's call as did the Apostle Paul. There are some of you who may not have to marry. There are some of you who may have to decide not to draw a salary. You know, these days, sometimes I even feel ashamed to be called a pastor in public, not because I don't want to be a pastor or be associated with ministry. But the, the thing is, pastoral or these, uh, these prophets of these days are actually synonymous or they are equivalent to money. They are looking for money. They are, they, you find them just, the gospel is, has become a business a business where people become pastors in order to manipulate people and make money from people. You know, some of you may have to respond to God and say, I will stay in my trade like the apostle Paul. He was a tent maker. He did not draw a salary from the church. He pulled no per diems. He pulled no allowances. I take off my heart before this holy man of God because there are many of us today who cannot preach, who cannot go for one month from our wives and we become sick. 
we there's many of us who may not even move one inch without a salary i'm not setting this as a standard but i am simply saying you will learn in christian history that people repeatedly will quote paul and refer to paul's example as an example of ministry and they will emulate his calling he was willing to die and risk paul is one person who says don't trouble my heart. You're saying they will kill me. I am ready for that. That's this man. Now, let's uh, do one more thing before I close on this presentation. Remember, we are dealing with the first 100 years. It's important for us at this time to remember that when the apostles were coming to the end of their lives, they died. The Apostle Paul died, Peter died, and the last Apostle John also died. After these men died, the people they had groomed, who we would say the apostles, the, the followers of the apostles, these are the ones we call the church fathers, the pre nicene church father. The Council of Nicaea, which is later to be held in 325, all these fathers before the Nicaean uh, Council are pre called the pre Nicaean Church Fathers. Now, again, you see two groups. I told you to remember the West and the East. We have uh, in the West one of the Church Fathers in this period on the screen is Clement of Rome. And Clement of Rome wrote, all these are writers, all these are writers. That is how come we are listing them here. And in the East, now remember the East. Always keep in mind, the East is where you have Greece, Athens, and those who are highly influenced by philosophy. This is the area of Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher Zeno. This is the, where they were. So you find writers, church fathers, also writing with a lot of influence coming from their region, which, had, which was fa fa fairly philosophical. And then the Romans this side. And you have Ignatius, Polycarp, Pseudo Barnabas, Papias, Shepherd of Hermas. All these do, uh, wrote some things. When you gather the teachings of the New Testament, church in Acts, and the writings of these people, you come up with some of the things that were common in the teachings of the church. And the following were some of those things. The church father's teachings, which includes the, the New Testament. Number one, the church at that time believed in the heavenly citizens or heavenly citizenship, not Roman citizenship. Why is this an important element in the church at that time? Remember, at that time, becoming a Roman citizen is what everybody sought. But the gospel of God came and said to them, you are not to seek after the citizenship on earth. Your citizenship is in heaven. This was a huge concept. When a person became a believer, they belonged to the heavenly uh, citizenship. This actually will become one of the reasons they will be persecuted because they will first of all put their allegiance first to heaven before they put their allegiance to the Roman authorities. So that when they are told to choose between pagan worship and or worship of the true God, they said, I'm a heavenly citizen. I am a citizen of the heavenly kingdom, and that's what I choose. One was admitted to this kingdom through baptism of water. That was just how the New Testament treated it. Wednesday and Fridays were fasting days. You find this in all the writings of the, the people I just showed, who were the church fathers. The Lord's Supper was repeated three times, was repeated three times a day. The Lord's Prayer, sorry, please. Please, please, please remember that. The Lord's Prayer was repeated three times a day. Almsgiving was better than fasting or prayer. This is how 
they looked at, uh, at faith. Second marriage or marriages were discouraged. Uh, this, this is the teaching. You find this in the Didache, you find this in the right Hemas, you find this in Pseudo Barnabas, you find this in the Ignatius writings. These were the things that were commonly practiced. Generosity to the poor, orphans and widows was expected. Slaves were regarded as brothers. You will notice in the New Testament, they did not attack, New Testament authors don't attack the institution of slavery. Instead, they simply said whether a person is a slave or a master, they become brothers. This would be one of the contentious problems why even Christians would be persecuted because it's like they were disturbing the social order of the time. Wealthy believers freed those who were prisoners. Uh, in other words, when a person was a master and he had slaves, they would, uh, they would free them and uh, give them freedom because in Christ Jesus all were one. They ate the Lord's Supper as often as they could. This is what the New Testament change was like. The New Testament that began spreading. What are the big things we've covered? We've covered the big things, which is number one, know the geography of the Mediterranean basin. Number two, know that the book of Acts after chapter nine, Paul takes over as the apostle to the Gentile. Know who the apostle Paul is and what he brought to ministry, his commitment to Christ. Then after the apostles and all of that, remember the church fathers, continued the preaching and the taking care of the church as we have covered. Thank you and blessings until we meet again in another session. May the Lord bless you. Thank you, scholars. We'll see you later.